Next to our focus on regulatory developments related to chemical control regulations, Chemcon the Americas 2025 has a strong focus on sustainability. And in Boston we organize something new, our INSPIRE Investment in Sustainable Growth Forum. This forum aims to connect and inspire investors, corporate sustainability officers and regulators by sharing and exploring implementation and investment experiences in a sustainable value chain. There is a clear need for investment in sustainable growth, so I am happy to discuss the forum with Alexandra McPherson, the Director of the Investor Environmental Health Network for Clean Production Action. Ali, before we focus on the forum, can you provide a short introduction on the Investor Environmental Health Network? Great. Yes, I would love to introduce the Investor Environmental Health Network and we are excited to partner on this forum with ChemCon. IHN is based out of a nonprofit called Clean Production Action and Clean Production Action has other projects like the Chemical Footprint Survey and the Green Screen for Safer Chemicals that I'll be talking about today. We primarily work on helping really transition to safer chemicals economy. Specifically, IHN works to help asset managers predominantly in the United States and Europe assess how companies are really future-proofing supply chains and really meeting growing demands for safer chemicals that are inherently better for human health, climate change, biodiversity. So we work a lot on the business case of why now, why are there big trends pushing companies to accelerate this transition? We develop sector-specific tools to evaluate portfolio risk for investors and, and look at corporate resiliency and competitiveness in the, in the face of these major market changes. We also create, create engagement tools. So that means that we help investors set disclosure and performance goals with companies that use and produce chemicals. And, and everything we do really helps encourage companies to set um, new goals that improve disclosure, advance safer chemical management programs, and really reduce financial, human health, and environmental risks. Thanks. Our two-day special forum starts with a joint Sustainable Wednesday program that offers investors a deep dive together with authorities and industry experts in the ambitions, challenges and consequences of the transition towards a more sustainable industry. On Thursday, the forum continues with roundtable discussions where best practices and benchmarks of sustainable approaches for industry are shared. Ellie, can you, based on your experience, share some of those best practices and benchmarks? Right, so I think a big appeal of this forum would be that we we do talk about um, best practice and we look at where there's alignment on best practice or where there isn't alignment. Um, but just to give some perspective on sort of how we think about best practice, um, our investors really leverage tools like the Chemical Footprint Survey or certification programs like the Green Screen or the Environmental Protections uh, Agency's Safer Choice Program, ChemBoards, Verified Chemistry. These all have very clear metrics on how to you know, advance safer chemical management programs. And, and we really leverage those um, to, again, look at corporate resiliency, future-proofing supply chains, and competitiveness. And so I wanted to just provide some you know, examples of where we're seeing very positive change and the type of change that we would like to talk about at this forum that hopefully can be scaled across all sectors and all companies. And I'm going to talk about three areas. One is we are really seeing hazard-based approaches to chemical management and safety gaining traction. So companies are expanding commitments and using tools like the CFP survey to benchmark progress. Some examples include Reckitt. They have a, you know, a wide array of consumer-facing company or consumer-facing products. They are working to reduce their chemical footprint um, by 65% by 2030. And they're also working to have 50% of their net revenue come from more sustainable products with a very clear definition that sustainable products is less carbon, less water, and safer chemistries that meet, meet verified chemistry metrics. Walmart, for example, also um, already met their goal to reduce their chemical footprint. Um, originally, they set a 10% goal by 2022. They, they succeeded uh, surpassed that with a 17% 
um, reduction. And a lot of that was achieved through reformulization and um, working to get certification um, to new programs to ensure they were using safer substitutes. Other big companies, other big brands, Ecolab, Dollar General, Dollar Tree, Walt Disney, Becton Dickinson, Procter & Gamble, Target, Rite Aid are just examples. Companies all participate in the chemical footprint project and then disclose and share their project, their progress with investors. The second big area um, in where we're starting to see industry best practice and, and progress is in the space of um, mapping biodiversity dependency and impact on biodiversity. So, for example, you know, are they reducing pesticides that are inherently causing biodiversity loss? So we have Costco and Starbucks mapping global supply chains for biodiversity, and we have Kroger and Walmart really working with their food suppliers to reduce pesticide use. And then the final area that we're seeing very significant progress on is companies are tra- starting to really address the material risks of environmental injustice. And um, Becton Dickinson, for example, is a company that has set up a new environmental justice program that includes um, engaging with community stakeholders in areas where they have production that are concerned about exposure to chemicals of concern and also includes R&D programs that are advancing safer sterilization programs for, for, for replacing chemicals of concern like ethylene oxide. Great examples. During the forum, we will discuss imminent threats to investment portfolios as well as value creation opportunities. How can we support investors with the assessment of these threats and opportunities in order for them to innovate and enhance the value? Yeah, so I think if the, the forum addressing threats and opportunities is just key for investors. They're really trying to understand what are the major threats and where are the major opportunities and where is their alignment around those. Um, I want to talk about six trends that we hope that we will be talking about at this forum that we think are really important um, to this issue and are driving major transitions. One is consumer sentiment is changing. So we see particularly among younger um, customers, there's growing expectations for ingredient transparency, product safety, sustainability attributes. How are companies meeting these new expectations? That's one area. Two, we see regulations both are on the rise and sometimes not sufficient to protect against risk. So we saw this with the Johnson & Johnson um, scenario where they were using... um, talc that was contaminated with asbestos that was legal. It met regulatory um, requirements, but it ended up causing a a massive business risk in sort of the litigation space. So both how are companies preparing for new regulations, but also how are companies understanding that um, they often have to go beyond regulations to protect um, and future-proof their supply chains. The third area is litigation is increasing risks and business costs. And PFAS is obviously um, the, 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 the most significant area of concern regarding that. Um, there's been some accounts that the PFAS lawsuits may eclipse the $200 billion paid by the big tobacco settlement. Um, also, UBS estimates that the total market capitalization of companies um, who will be impacted by PFAS regulations is for $30 trillion. So these are just very significant financial um, liabilities that um, investors want to really understand and, and, and support companies in addressing. The fourth area is we really see disclosure expectations increasing. So can we dive deep in this forum into um, new regulations like the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive and really understand whether or not companies have the readiness to meet the new expectations. The fifth area is that governments, civil society are really creating new frameworks. So the UN created the Global Framework on Chemicals that is setting 2030 targets that will impact how companies um, think about chemicals and the expectations set on companies. Those 2030 targets also ask finance, the finance community to also set up chemical management programs and due diligence on this. Um, The final piece I would say is that investors in the United States and in the US are seeing real value um, 
in investing in safer chemistries. And, and they've already acknowledged that it is a material risk to continue using chemicals of concern. If you just look at the um, Sustainable Accounting Standards Board, SASB, in major sectors, there's huge areas of disclosure requirements around product revenue, on um, chemicals of concern, and product revenue on safer chemistry. So those are some of the trends I think would be you know highly valuable to look at threats and opportunities um, in this forum. How can we motivate and create the desired changes across the chemical industry value chain? Yeah, great. Um, well, you know, to motivate and create the desired change, I think we all want. I, you know, I think we provide some really good examples already about where we see you know change happening already. Um, we want to build on that momentum, build on that best practice. I think you know this forum could really help us though figure out where alignment is on best practice because that would help accelerate change or scale it faster. Um, so, can we get better alignment on? what the trans transition looks like towards safer chemistries. How do we measure it? Um, how do we prioritize which major chemicals of concern need to be prior need to be safely substituted with R&D? That, that, I think, would really help with some of the motivation. It is great to see the opportunities across the value chain. What kind of incentives should governments create to support the actual transition from a brownfield industry towards a greenfield industry? Yes. Yes, um, governments you know, really do have a huge role to play. And um, we've talked a lot about emerging regulations and that is significantly having an impact on the marketplace. I would be really um, excited for our forum to talk about some of the incentive-based programs that governments can set up. So can they set up programs that give economic advantage or tax um, incentives, tax credits, more um, funding for the critical R&D that has to happen for safer chemistries to some of the PFAS applications, for example, that don't have a substitute. I think governments have a huge role in stimulating um, this transition. And we, we do know that the current chemical industry, many of the petrochemicals that we rely on for our everyday products have been heavily subsidized. So it's going to take government incentive programs to really make this transition and this forum could really explore some of those given that we will have major you know, leaders from government as well as industry and investor to see well, what would be the best vehicles for change. Thank you for your valuable contribution, Ellie. I'm already looking forward to many inspiring contributions of Ellie and the other stakeholders at Chemco the Americas Inspire Investment in Sustainable Growth Forum in March in Boston.